a pay-per-view that seemed dull on paper. Now, to be honest, I didn't really have much interest in this one barring the main event, because for one, Roman Reigns is gone, he never defends the title, Randy Orton is away, and it just felt like they were doing a pay-per-view for the sake of it. Add to that, SmackDown didn't really have many matches on this show, I believe they only had one match. Similar to a bunch of events though, they over-delivered and actually got hyped as time went on, and even then there was a little doubt over the main events because of Cody Rhodes' uh, injury. That said, let's get into it. The first match is the Raw Women's Championship. Bianca Belair defended the gold against Asuka and Becky Lynch. So basically one of the only marquee matches on the card. I never put much thought into this one and initially it was actually Asuka and Bianca. That would have been good, but that's for another day. The one with the bell rang here, I, I just knew it was going to be good. It fit the criteria of what an opening match should be. It should get you into the show and this match did just that. Not a single dull moment, and I'm not over-exaggerating. The heat in action was on point. Becky and Asuka, Bianca and Asuka, whoever. The other would come in and break the fall, and as time went on, I actually started to believe Asuka could win it. It sounds stupid saying it now, but I really started believing it. And to understand how much I enjoyed this match, if they wrestled for an hour, I wouldn't have had a problem. The bad part about this match is it brought so much excitement that I was like, uh, we're not going to see something as good as this until the end of the show, and even then we might not even see it. But yeah, one of the best triple threat matches in a while. I mean, Asuka being in the ring guaranteed this would be great. Then you add Becky and Bianca, it's like packing a terrible player in FIFA. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. And that's what it was. It was a hot opener. The Chicago crowd was into it. And once again, when a crowd's into a match, I enjoy it more so. This was already good, but with the crowd going crazy for it, it was even better. The next match was a handicap match. Omas and MVP faced Bobby Lashley. Wasn't this a cell match or something initially? They changed it, I believe. One thing for certain is that I want this feud to be over. That said, this match was better than expected. Cedric was constantly annoying MVP over the last couple of weeks, and because of this, made his presence felt during the match. One of the reasons why I liked this match more than the WrestleMania Backlash match was because of the crowd. They were just reacting to almost anything that was going on in the ring. You know, Lashley dropping MVP, pushing away Omos, whatnot. They bring this additional energy to these matches. Also, shout out to MVP's diss track. It really caught me off guard before the match began because I didn't expect him to trash Bobby Lashley like that. Lashley won it and damn did he look so over after the match. And the man just didn't give a damn at this point and decided to grab a fan's title. Teasing what's to come, I assume. Hopefully, because Roman Reigns hasn't defended the title, and Bobby Lashley would be a great challenger. Following this, Kevin Owens was set to expose the fraud, in his eyes I should note, Elias. He was gonna face Ezekiel. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't have much hope for this match. It was a goofy, enjoyable storyline. Ezekiel's interview in the pre-show was hilarious, but I thought it would stop there. I'm glad that I was wrong. It's not like the greatest match in the world, but it was uh, somewhat enjoyable. Ezekiel, which sounds so damn hilarious when the commentary call him that, brought so much intensity as time went on. He became Macho Man Randy Savage in the beginning, bled, showed the fighting spirit, all that. He, he really brought it as did Kevin Owens, but that's expected. Owens brought some comedy to the match, shouting that Ezekiel's a liar, is going insane, and I couldn't really say I was disappointed with this at all. Owens' storyline was going absolutely insane, just trying to prove that this is a liar, and the way he hit that stun near the end was something else. He won, and I assume he's off to feud with somebody like Bobby Lashley. It's hard to say, because both those guys are coming off these post-WrestleMania feuds, and I feel it would make sense to pair them together, but who knows. The next match was six-person action. Judgment Day faced the original club, well, technically, Featuring Liv Morgan. I think a bunch of us wanted this to be inside the cell, but nonetheless this was good. Sounds basic, but I have my reasons. Apparently this was 16 minutes, which almost sounds unbelievable as it felt like 11 for me. And it's nice to see Balor and Liv in the spotlight again. For Liv, it was a very memorable performance. She was in a somewhat tough situation being in there with former world champions, but she did very well. Best parts of the match for me were when Edge and Finn interacted. And the fact that it actually happened feels kind of weird because these guys are from two totally different eras. Even weirder than that was the result of the match as the losing club took yet another L. And of course it was Finn who took the cover. I believe this is to establish Judgment Day because of the new faction and whatnot. One thing that caught my eye was the Judgment Day staring deeply into him after the match, and Edge somewhat nodded towards him, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but just wanted to mention it. I like the match itself, but I know if there was a rematch, they could do more than that. It's not underwhelming, it's not disappointing, it's none of that, it's just you know they could do more than that if they were to have a rematch. Either that, or they finished early because AJ was bleeding badly. I don't know, but one thing for certain is that I like this match. If they do have a rematch, I wouldn't object. Although I doubt it'd be the case because it feels like this is the feud that's supposed to establish Edge's faction. The next match was a no-holds-barred match between Madcap Moss and Happy Corbin. Madcap went from 0 to 100 within 2 weeks. He really showed intensity here, and this one was very violent and would feel so out of depth with the old Madcap. Good thing the new Madcap has the tools to excel in this type of match. He looked more menacing than the heel 
in this match which is rare in wwe and as i said last time around i didn't care for this match initially but they kinda keyword kinda won me over I just wish the feud's over though because I want to see these two doing other things. Madcap unlocked some of that potential others have been talking about for a while now. He basically killed Corbin and this sounds weird to say but I hope he is never happy again. The damn character has run its course. He comes out. 2014-22 Jump Street-esque music and it's just eh. His last few characters have been disappointing. Applebee's Corbin, King Corbin and this. Maybe you should go back to being poor Corbin because that was honestly some compelling stuff and I wouldn't have a problem with it if it were to return. As for Madcap, this is the beginning perhaps. It's probably going to work on his attire, they're going to change his entrance music, maybe good things are in store. The next match was for the United States Championship. Austin Theory, or as they call him now, Theory defends the gold against Mustafa Ali. So Ali is surprisingly back. He hasn't missed a beat in ring and his return is welcoming for me. Theory has been pushed hard in recent months and the result was very obvious here. I don't think anybody had a doubt that Austin Theory was going to retain. That said, the hometown hero did give some very small glimmer of hope. It wasn't much, but you could feel it a bit. The match was decent. Both men brought in. While it doesn't stand out from this card, it was yet another nice addition. Theory really brought the intensity in recent weeks and showed another side to him, which is nice. I hope that develops. As for Ali, if he won this match, Chicago would have went crazy. They are ready for it, but unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Plus, I doubt Ali would win the title so close to John Cena's return. It just seems like... That's the match they're going to have, you know, Austin Theory, the kid that resembles young Cena going up against the face that runs the place, or in this case, ran the place. Cena being the conquering hero that rids everyone of this annoying rookie and wins back the US title, perhaps? I don't know. I can honestly imagine, you know, SummerSlam, those two facing off. And I would wish John Cena would face somebody else, but it is what it is. And the main event, Cody Rhodes faces Seth Rollins inside Hell in a Cell. To say I was hyped for this one would be an understatement. WWE really booked this feud well and made every match feel important. The guys delivered on each match in different ways. WrestleMania had the atmosphere, the surprise element. Backlash had the impressive action in this. This had some superb storytelling. Earlier, it was revealed that Cody tore his right pectoral. This made everyone's emotions and hype towards the match take a 180. Sort of what Big Show used to do every couple of months. We were all expecting this classic that would solidify Cody as a guy, but now we had doubts. Okay. He comes out, it's like, oh, he's hurt, but then he unveils the injury, and never did I think his neck tattoo would be overshadowed. The match turned cringeworthy from there, like, how can a man wrestle under these conditions? How? Turns out Cody Rhodes is built different. I guess what they say in his song is true, adrenaline is indeed in his soul. Otherwise, there may be a couple of reasons. For one, he watched his father and the wrestlers of old ignore their injuries just to entertain the fans and make some money. The old school mentality is ingrained in him, and it shows. Hell, the entire story was about wanting to prove himself and do good for his father. He showed pride and passion in a situation he didn't need to, because let's be honest, would anyone hate Cody for not competing? No. He had every reason not to wrestle. The doctors probably suggested he didn't. I don't know what the hell went on in the back, but he was out here. He showed heart, he showed passion, and even though he was hurt, he still found enough to construct a great story. Seth Rollins, on the other hand, was the ultimate troll. 99 overall in that area easily. He showed his reliability in this situation. Cody was never hurt with him and was taken care of, and the match featured cowbells, polka dots, tables, and of course, courage. It felt bad watching it at first, but after Cody endured the pain and started dishing it out, it was compelling. Was there a memorable spot? Maybe the kendo sticks or the cowbell? What elevates this match is once again Cody's endurance. You can feel that he wanted this to go well despite the injury. It's admirable and makes him look like a superhero, which is what I feel he always intended to be. The near falls were very convincing for me, and I thought with the injury, the match could end at any time, and it really made things dramatic. I was so into the match, wanting to see this amazing comeback unfold, and I'm glad that I did. He beat Seth Rollins 3-0. He slapped him in all kinds of situations using the surprise element, in this case using his heart and determination. One of the best performances I've ever seen, and I know I'm not the only one who thought this, but Cody here was like Jordan with the flu against the Jazz. In his case, there was doubt over delivering. Sure, he was booked to win it, but getting there was a problem. It's a weird-ass match. And at times I was confused as to why I was watching a man with a purple chest wrestle. But as time went on, I understood why he was here. I always had respect for Cody Rhodes, but now it's gone to a whole other level. The will and dedication to his craft makes this one of my favorite matches of the year and one of my favorite Hell in a Cell matches. Will I watch it again so soon? Hell no. It was somewhat hard to watch to see this man come out with this injury and wrestle it. You just saw him struggle and it was hard to watch. But yeah, easily match of the night. Alright, that's Hell in a Cell. Once again... WWE pay-per-view over delivers. The builds are very forgettable. They make you doubt whether or not the show is going to be good. But then <laughs> show happens and it turns out to be good. If anything, when WWE hypes up the show, it turns out to be underwhelming like SummerSlam last year. But this one was nice. I wouldn't say there was a terrible, terrible match. But 
My problem with the show is the fact that there wasn't many SmackDown matches. Ricochet should have defended the title here. I think it would have made sense, but it is what it is. This show will definitely be remembered because of Cody Rhodes' performance. The fact that he decided to go out there despite his injury was something else. And obviously, there's problems with that. The fact that he would actually go out there. But I gotta respect that. The fact that he would do it is... Is truly something else. Alright, what would you guys think of Hell in a Cell? Please comment down below and that's it for this video. Make sure you hit the stunner on the like button and perhaps the crossroads of the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.